Uh, good morning. I'm Bob Swindell, President and CEO of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our second event in this year's Alliance Leadership Speaker Series. As I mentioned last month, the Speaker Series was the brainchild of Gail Bolfin, with the goal of setting the stage for our members and others in the community to get a close, up close and personal uh, interaction with leaders in the world of business, finance, education, and current affairs. Last month, our speaker was Joanna Garrity, president of JetBlue Airlines, and her uh, talk with uh, Juliet Rulak was inspiring. I think everyone that was a part of uh, last month's program really enjoyed it. Um, as you all know, Juliet is a past chair of the Alliance, and she's the director of external affairs for FPL. Today, we go from talking about flying in the air to flying on the ice and a conversation between Matt Caldwell, president and CEO of the Florida Panthers Hockey Club, and Andrew Bowers, the executive director of operations for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, before I go over the program um, and turn it over to Andrew as moderator, I'd like to thank the Seminole Tribe of Florida for not only being a CEO council member of the Alliance, but also being a presenting sponsor of today's event. I'd like to ask Andrew to give us an update on some of the activities of the tribe. Andrew? Absolutely, thank you, Bob, for having me. Uh, the tribe is honored to partner with the Alliance and sponsor this event and continue to build a better Broward. Uh, a little bit about the tribe. The tribe is a sovereign nation consisting of 4,200 tribal members living across six reservations here in the state of Florida and 48 of the remaining 50 states. We're the proud owners of the Hard Rock International and also are one of the largest cattle and sugarcane producers in the southeastern United States. The tribe is committed to being good stewards of the environment and committing to protecting our home here in the Everglades. Uh, we look forward to a successful event here and continued partnerships with our neighbors here in Broward County. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for your support of the Alliance. In addition to the Seminole Tribe, I wanna thank the series sponsors who are listed on the screen and also the South Florida Business Journal, our annual series media sponsor. Thanks to the Business Journal for their partnership and helping bring this important speaker series to everyone. And hopefully you are all reading the journal to stay connected and keep up with the breaking news in the business community. I know I never miss it. I look forward to getting my uh, copy when it arrives. I'm so old fashioned. I like to read the, the print version before I go to the digital. Um, if you check out today's cover story, you'll find a really interesting story featuring three businesses that opened over the last seven months during the pandemic. And thank you for, as a thank you for joining us today, the business journal would like to offer a special rate of 25% off a one year print and digital subscription, which also includes the business journals signature book of lists. Uh, my copy of the book of lists arrived uh, this week, as a matter of fact. If you want to take advantage of this offer, you can email the address on the screen and mention the Alliance Speaker Series. And now onto our program. Today's moderator, Andrew Bowers, is Executive Director of Operations for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. A couple of cool things to know about Andrew. Um, he's a native Floridian. Andrew is a graduate of Florida State University, and he also has a, a Bachelor of Science in Sports Management. His first job uh, working uh, after school was as a cattle hand, and he said his greatest business achievement is mentoring seven college graduates. Andrew, we're pleased to have you as moderator today, and now over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Bob, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was very excited whenever I was approached about the opportunity to moderate this event, uh, and was even more excited whenever it was announced who our speaker was going to be for the day. Um, this is a very authentic gentleman uh, who I myself look up to as a leader, uh, and I've got my notepad ready today because I'm confident he's going to be sharing a lot of good information with us today. Uh, so with that, I'll get into the introduction. Matt Caldwell was named the president and CEO of the Florida Panthers Hockey Club on April 9, 2016, after joining the Panthers two years before as the organization's chief operating officer. Prior to joining the Panthers, he worked as vice president at Goldman Sachs in their investment management division, where he helped families and institutions invest their capital. Before transitioning into the finance industry, Matt served five years in the US Army as a military officer, where he conducted combat operations in Iraq, peacekeeping operations in Kosovo, and spent time in Germany training soldiers as they prepared to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. During the course of his Army career, he was awarded a Bronze Star Medal, an Iraq Campaign Medal, and a NATO, and a NATO Kosovo Military Medal. Matt is also a community steward always open to new ways that he and the Florida Panthers might play a meaningful role in the betterment of Broward County. To date, the Florida Panthers Foundation has committed over $5 billion for local issues, especially those focusing on veterans, youth hockey, children's health and education, and appropriately raising awareness about our endangered Florida Panther. 
In addition to the CEO Council of the Alliance, Matt sits on the Orange Bowl Committee, the Broward Workshop Executive Committee, and has been appointed to the Broward College District Board of Trustees. He received his Juris Doctorate from Northwestern University School of Law, his MBA from Northwestern Kellogg School of Management, and his Bachelor of Science from West Point. Matt lives here in Fort Lauderdale with his lovely wife and their daughter, Flora. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Great, morning, thank you, sir. Andrew. Yeah, good morning. Appreciate that introduction. I, uh, I need to get that whole thing sent over to me and give it to my PR staff. That was perfect. Uh, Cause I only give you bits and pieces and your team did a great job. So thank you. Understood, how are you? You're looking good, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, I wish I can say I was actually in the Panthers locker room, but as you can probably tell, this is a virtual background, but that's, that's what our locker room looks like. But I am at the, yeah, I'm, at, I'm in the arena. <clears throat> we started training camp this week. Uh, so hockey is back. Uh, it's, it's obviously been a crazy year for everyone, especially the sports and entertainment concert industry. And, uh, you know, a week from yesterday. So next Thursday is our first game. So we'll be wow. playing at home. Yeah. Playing the Dallas stars and they're coming into town and, um, yeah, this was just finalized a few weeks ago. So we've been running crazy and trying to get, you know, ramped up and ready for the year. Fantastic. Well, go Panthers. Thank you. Yeah, thank yes, you. sir. Well, let, let's jump in this and let's start. Let's jump into this conversation. Let's start somewhere um, at the foundation and uh, a, a place that you and I hold near and dear to our heart. And that's family. Um, yeah. I know you share a close bond with your family. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about and elaborate for the group about growing up in New York and maybe some of the lessons that you learned in the big city of New York and yeah. some of those lessons maybe that you learned from your parents and how they influence your leadership today? Yeah, no, thank you for leading with that. Um, you know, you don't read uh, about family as much as it really should in your resume. And you, know, you can go to all the fancy schools and have these great experiences, but your family is your bedrock and, and it's where you start sometimes for better or worse for me it was uh actually probably both sometimes but for, mo for the most part better um i have a great family very loving family uh my dad was a new york city cop um my i'm the youngest of four uh we have two teachers in my family and then my other brother works uh for verizon um all new york and uh you know some some have moved out to new jersey um but we're we're really a classic uh, you know you know, pretty blue collar New York City family where, you know, they they were all born. My dad was born and raised in Brooklyn uh, in Bay Ridge. If anyone, I'm sure there's plenty of people that know Brooklyn on this on this uh, Zoom. And, you know, he, born and raised in Bay Ridge. My whole family was born there. Um, when I was born, they moved to the suburbs, which is Staten Island for, for New York uh, City people. Um, still one of the five boroughs, but the Forgotten Island is nothing – Nothing like Manhattan or Brooklyn or all the other ones that you've heard of, and um, yeah, that's where we grew, that's where I grew up my whole life was Staten Island, and you know, uh, it, there's so many things that I can talk about, but I, I think starting with my father, um, my dad, um, you know, uh, given his police background, he always had a sense of service in him, and um, he uh, was a little crazy, um, but he always did things from a sense of love and. I'll always, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. And he, um, you know, he always taught me, you know, the basic principles of working hard and always trying to save your dollars and save for your future, invest in your family. And, you know, I think he instilled in me that, you know, I can do whatever I want in life. I can try to be a cop if I wanted to, like, maybe not a fireman, because there was always rivalry between those two, but anything else I think was, was wide open. And when I told him that I was interested in going to the military, um, I think it was a little bit of a surprise just because we had no background, uh, and the, you know, no family history background. But um, I think when he found out that uh, the government pays for your education, I think he was really excited. My dad's always looking to, you know, save, save a buck. And uh, he, he's just a very old school uh, operator. And I remember um, when I got my job on Wall Street, uh, I would actually like bring him to like client events because he was so like marketable for us, you know, all these like big wigs would just love me and around him. And I remember one of the, the big clients saying to me, he's like, your father's like a national treasure. You know, these guys don't exist anymore. Always tell me what discount to get at the grocery store and where I can, you know, um, save money here, what I should do here, where I should travel, do this. Um, he just always uh, was looking out for people, always um, putting other people, you know, interest. And 
and needs before his own. And he, he just taught me so much about being grounded and, and working hard. And, um, and, you know, he, he never directed like where I needed to go, but he gave me so much love and support to get, you know, that uh, you know, just gave him the strength to keep moving forward. So um, there's so many great stories about him, funny stories that I can share. Um, and, um, you know, I think with him, you know, if I had to think about a trait, you know, that, that sticks with me today, uh, is really just perseverance. You know, he, he's been through so much in his life. You know, he came from a, a very poor family where, you know, his father, you know, left the family at a very young age and he was the oldest of four, you know, the opposite of me, I'm being the youngest. And, um, you know, he also had a, an age gap between him and his next sibling. So you know, he really became like the man of the household and the husband of the household and his, his, his mom wasn't able to work. So, you know, even at a young age, 12, 13 years old, he was, you know, having a full-time job and going to school, going to school during the day and having a full-time job at night. And I think that his, um, his perseverance and getting through that time uh, and, and never taking no, never taking no for an answer um, has always stayed with me. I mean, you know, when you were, when you were reading my resume before, um, sorry, Mr. Um, when, when, when you were reading my resume before um, those are, it's easy to read about all the successes, but I, there's so many more failures, you know, this, I mean, I can talk at, at length of so many things I failed at. Uh, and no one tells those stories. Everyone wants to just brag about the good times, but that's what I learned from my dad, you know, is, is it was always about just getting back up and showing up the next day and, and having that, you know, perseverance to keep going. Um, sometimes it almost becomes, becomes, uh, and I mean this in a, in a complimentary way, it's almost like, an ignorant way of operating. Like if someone, someone tells you no, like 99 times, you're just showing up for number hundred, but maybe you should try a different route. You know, uh, you could have cut that off at, you know, 10 times, but, but I think all that was uh, uh, something that's really stuck with me as a leader today. Fantastic. And, 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 and sticking with the theme of family, uh, you and your wife have a young daughter. Um, so I'm sure that that's keeping you very busy. Talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit about obviously managing that work life balance, but then even how, having children may have changed or influenced your leadership style or perception on leadership. How has that had an influence on you? Yeah, it's changed me a lot. I'll, I'll get to the, how it's changed my leadership style, but um, you know, I, I, you know, I've always come from a family of love and great support and they were always there for me, whether I was deployed in Iraq or, you know, going into law school and had my head buried in the library. They're always there for me. And um, you know, I, I, I settled down a little bit, later in life, not that there's any uh, rules on when you should get married, but uh, I didn't get married until I was 38 and, and, and I was 39 when we had Flora. Um, um, and, you know, it, you know, when you, at least for me, when I got to that age, I was pretty set in my ways about how I operated and, and my, I have a, a, a mil, you could probably imagine a militant schedule of time when I yes. get up and working out and, and when I eat and this, like every minute is planned and where I have to be. And, uh, that all goes out the window when you have uh, a baby. Uh, first off, they, they rule the house, number one. But number two, you, your life changes and like perspective changes. And, and um, you know, the first couple of months, she was born um, November 23rd, you know, not this past one, but a year ago, 2019. And it was right in the heart of the season. So I, I took a few weeks off. But of course, by New Year's, I was like guns blazing, trying to get back into my flow. And, and um, you know, January, February, and I can tell my wife is so great and supportive of me, but I could tell she, she was probably saying to me, you need to be home more. You, you know, you, you're trying to get right back to work and the pandemic hit. And um, as horrible as that's been on so many levels, um, you know, I've lost, you know, my, my dad during this time and not exactly from COVID, but just in the heart of all this. Um, and it, it's been a horrible year, but the one silver lining is it's forced me to be home more and, and focus. And it's been, it's been great. It's made me learn um, that there, ha there really truly has to be a work-life balance. And, and now, you know, I can tell you one, you know, one thing, um, you know, that, that has really, you know, um, you know, stuck with me that, that started during the pandemic is my wife and I would wake up and, you know, whether it was 6 a.m., 7 a.m., whenever the baby's yelling and screaming and, and go uh, do a walk around the neighborhood, you know, we're in Rio Vista, right. Fort Lauderdale. It's, great community and um you know i i after a few weeks of doing that i said you know what i'm i'm never going to stop doing this like whenever she gets up i'm uh, you know taking a half hour and i'm out there i'm off my phone and i'm laser focused on this and so even with the season start up we did a walk this morning and and I, and I know you're very very family oriented i'd love to hear 
how your dad's influenced you and, and I know you just had a second kid so absolutely absolutely yeah. so uh much like you um very influenced by my father uh set the bar very high for me uh my dad grew up uh you know on an Indian reservation no running water no electricity no walls mm -hmm. in a thatched roof house or in a thatched roof house um but was able to attend law school and go on and later serve um, here as a councilman within the tribe. So that set the bar very high for me that um, with from very modest means to be able to, you know, put your head down and work hard that anything is possible. But then much like you spoke to about that service that was ingrained in me as well about coming back and giving to the tribe or, or coming back and giving to the community um, in which you live. So that's been ingrained in me early. Yeah, um, so it was very uh, yeah. interesting to hear you touch on that as well, given that obviously you were up in New York and I'm down here in Florida, but some of those yeah, same. Yeah, that's the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you learned that from Florida State, although Florida State's a great school, you know? You, you learn those <laughs> traits uh, from your dad and, and, and it's, it's beautiful. And, and that, those examples have given us, you know, the opportunity, and well, it's, you know, ingrained in us to provide that, you know, example to our own kids now, you know, and, and that perpetual love and support and, you know, perseverance, everything we've talked about is there. So nice. absolutely, I, uh, uh, I, I see. By the way, I see a couple of questions from the panelists. I was a little from the crowd. I just, I just wanted to touch on real quick. Was, you know, one was about. You know, I talked about perseverance from my dad, and 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 if I can give an example of how that, um, you know, influenced us in in my in my my work life, and I can give a uh, somewhat of a funny example, but it did have great long term effects for me. I remember when I was in the army and I decided to get out. I. Um, you know, uh, wanted to go back to, to business school, graduate school in general. I wound up doing a, a joint program, business school and law. And I was studying for the GMAT, which is the entrance exam uh, for your MBA and for your master's in business. And, you know, I just got back from Iraq. I was stationed in Germany. I was all over the place. And I just like walked into the testing center. And said, all right, you know, I can, I can do this. Um, I, I did grades at West Point and did not do well. Okay. Um, you know, the top, it's kind of like, it's like half of the SAT, the GMAT at the top score is an 800. And um, I got a uh, 500 on the first one. Okay. And most like really good schools, you have to be at least around like a 650. If you really want to get into like the top five or 10 schools, you got to be around 700 or so. Um, so I was like, all right, I got to get back to the, the books. I was about five years or so out, out of the, out of the college. And I just hunkered down and, and grabbed the GMAT books and did all the studying. I mean, I was in, I was in the middle of, um, I was just outside like Munich, Germany. So it's not like I had so much access to schooling, at least for the MBA in the U.S. And, mm -hmm. and I took it again and I only got like a 550 and I took it again and I think I got a 600. I might have taken like four or five times. I might have broke the record for like how many times you just keep going back. But and I remember like the third or fourth time that I took it and I told my family and and again, I only got like in the low sixes. Um, these are all great scores, by the way. For, but I wanted to really get to one of the schools that were highly ranked. And my brothers were like, all right, great. Well, you know, you know, maybe, you know, just lower your ambition here, or lower your dreams. And I was like, no, no, I'm sticking to this. And eventually blasted through and got like my 680 and got into Northwestern. But that would have never happened um, if my dad didn't teach me to keep putting my head down and, and going back at it. So. I wanted to share that. And, and someone also had mentioned about how do you, how do you build a positive organizational culture? This is extremely hard. Culture is, um, it's a, a buzzword. It's a word that's used a lot. Um, anyone can say, oh, you need to have a good culture. It's the hardest thing to do, uh, hands down. It, it starts with your leadership and leading by example. Like that one simple principle um, is, is the best, best way that you can, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, impact a positive example. So for example, last night we had a scrimmage here um, where we, you know, and, and we just started training camp this week. So we treated this as like an exhibition game warm up because we're playing a regular season game next week and the game started at seven and, you know, finished around nine, nine thirty. And by the time we got home, at the time we did post game meals and chatted with the players and coaches, I probably wasn't home till 10 30 or so. Um, you know, I wanted to see my wife and daughter a little bit um, and, you know, of course, Flora was up at some point during the night. Um, but, you know, eight o'clock this morning, me and the GM and the, the leaders here are, are, are here and we're showing up, we're smiling and we're positive. And, you know, these are the days that you really separate yourself from other franchises. So 
I think leading by example is, is a big way to, to start. And then, you know, um, I think that culture um, is just a, is a daily, if not hourly thing. Like, you know, you, you have to sit down and write out what you stand for and live it and breathe it and get everyone to buy in. And, and if you don't have people that are buying in, um, this might sound a little harsh. You just got to find somewhere else for them. You know, it's not going to work. And it takes one bad apple to, to ruin the bunch. So anyway, sorry, I just want to make sure I addressed some of the questions. No, the that's great. Great, great questions from uh, the crowd and obviously great feedback. I'm taking my notes and definitely stuff that we'll be able to take back to our respective organizations. Um, let's back up a little bit and talk about uh, West Point and how you began your military career. Uh, can you talk yeah. to us about some of those roles uh, and, I, and you talked a little bit about how the military has influenced your scheduling. Uh, how has that influenced your leadership style? Maybe some of those roles. Talk to us a little about some of the roles that you played and then maybe how that may have influenced uh, your leadership style or some of the tips yeah. that you may have brought from the military that carry you today. Yeah. So you know, I would say my family is, you know, the number one influence on me. And I talked a lot about my dad and I, I want to make sure I mention my mom because she was, you know, the, the person that kept everything. My dad was, you know, wild and crazy and intense. And, and my mom, I felt like always kept us together, you know, and she, my positivity definitely comes from her. You know, my father was always yelling and screaming about something, but my mom was always showing up. Uh, you know, she probably taught me more about perseverance than him because um, she had to deal with him all the time. And then also, you know, the four of us running all over the place. But um, the, the two of them have been absolutely incredible in my life. And then I think the second thing is is West Point. I mean, I, I probably didn't know what I was getting getting into. You know, you're 17, really 16, 17, you start the application process. You got to get a letter from Congress. Uh, you have to, it's a very intense process to get in. It's 10 times harder today. I would never get in today. I was lucky to do it, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago. Um, but, um, you know, w once I got into the academy, the academy takes in all these, you know, folks that are, you know, high school athletes, star quarterbacks, you know, school presidents, perfect score in the SAT. You know, you have all these different walks of life and uh, people that are great at any, you know, all these different areas. And they really kind of break you down and build you back up. You know, I think humility is the, is the first thing they teach you. Um, a lot of us walked in there 17, 18 years old thinking who the hell we were. Um, and they very quickly explained to you that you're nothing uh, and that we're going to push you to the brink and show you, um, you know, that there's always someone better and that, um, you know, you need to be humble in everything you do. Arrogance and, and, you know, um, leading people through, you know, fear and, um, you know, fear of getting in, in, you know, in trouble or, you know, looking down on people being condescending that, that there's a lot of those traits that sometimes are in uh, modern day leaders that West Point just rips out of you because soldiers will never follow you in battle if they don't feel like you're going to be in front and they don't feel that um, you would do what you, you know, you would do it first and better uh, before you tell them to do it. Right. So Sorry. they train you that you have to be the most physically fit. Right. And, you know, it, it would be an absolute embarrassment if anyone in your platoon beat you at anything, whether it was push-ups or sit-ups or, um, you know, uh, running or any of the physical activity. Ruck marches were very popular. You know, if you're not, if you're the leader of that platoon of 20, I wound up leading 40, 40 men at the time. It was all male unit combat, combat arms. Um, and, you know, if you can't outrun or out, you know, physicalized, if you will, um, any of those folks, they're not going to respect you. And, and then on top of that, you know, looking out, caring about them, showing empathy, being the first one in the office, last one out, you know, um, after a late night mission, checking on people, you know, making sure they're getting sleep, you know, all those, I mean, every checking, checking their feet, taking off their boots, making sure they're doing okay, making sure they're getting fed, making sure they're getting rest, uh, working them really hard, but, um, but always putting their interests first and people will do anything for you when they know that, you know, you care about them and West Point ingrained all that into me. And, you know, when I showed up to my first unit, um, I still had a, t a, t a lot to learn and I had a funny accent from Staten Island and all these folks are saying to me, you know, who is this, they call him butter bar because you have a Lieutenant bar on your you know, cap and it's, it's a uh, gold. Um, so, you know, the first couple of months, you're just learning at 21, 22, you have these, you know, old crusty sergeants that have been around forever and 
they'll call you sir and they'll respect you, but they'll push you a little bit. You know, you're almost like a rookie in training camp here in hockey and the veterans are always going to chime in on you. But what West Point really taught us to, um, you know, be out in front and be visible and do whatever it takes for your people and, and they'll rally behind you. So all those lessons have stayed with me. And, you know, when I showed up here at, at, the, at the Panthers, for example, um, when people, we, we created an environment for our sales floor that's very open bullpen style. You, know, you see this in a lot of technology companies, Wall Street trading firms are very much like this. You, you encourage interaction, no side offices, you know, sidebar conversations, private stuff. I mean, if you, have, if you need a private meeting, that's available, but everything should be open, transparent, interactive, team oriented. And uh, when any, whenever someone, I would sit right on the floor. Uh, at least in the beginning, I did. It got a little crazy after a while, but I would be right dead in the middle. And uh, when people would, when reps would sell a season ticket, I'd go knock out 20 push-ups in my suit, you know, right in the middle of the floor. Um, and uh, they loved it, just fired up the crew. And um, so funny story on that. I mean, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I was no, working this with, is great. yeah, I was working with South Florida Ford. They're a great sponsor uh, and partner of ours. Um, I don't know if anyone from Ford is, is on here, but they're wonderful. They have dealerships all over. And, and they had me speak at um, an event. God, I'm, I think it was Salute to Education, you know, one, one of the nonprofits they work with. And uh, I was talking and uh, kind of rambling. And I don't know what made me think of this. In fact, there's, I think a friend, you know, Greg Snowden is his name, planted this in my head uh, at some point. And I said, hey, Again, I was speaking to a, a bunch of high school students, about a thousand kids. I said, if any of you, they're all getting ready to go to, hopefully go to college or applying to school. I said, if any of you can beat me in a push-up contest, you'll get a thousand bucks from the Florida Panthers Foundation, right? And it was really quiet, just like how it probably is on the Zoom right now. Um, and all of a sudden, you saw a bunch of these moms like, get, get, you know, get your ass up there. And so I had like five or six um Sorry for the little curse word, but I had five or six, uh, you know, students come on the stage and um, they came on and right away I saw one guy that I was like, this guy's going to smoke me. I, he was just jacked. Uh, and I found out afterwards, he was, going, he was recruited by University of Miami. He was going to be a linebacker with them. Um, so, Congrats. and uh, yeah, so I beat five out of the six. Uh, and I think I hit like, 80 something push ups. Um, and I had a military guy, Sean McCaffrey. Some of you may know him. He was counting them, making sure they're, you know, uh, appropriate. But I knew I, I saw him and I was like, all right, this guy's way too confident. And he was like, just dialed in. And then, um, and then we started going. And, um, you know, when like you're running with someone and like they're talking the whole time and you're like dying, you know, like, he, you know, so I'm like, I, we weren't running, but I was doing push ups. He's like, come on, sir, you're doing all right. You're working hard. I mean, it was like very fluent conversation. This was like 30, 40. I'm like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. But I gave it everything I had. I mean, I, I think I hit like 86 or 87 um, in a suit, and he had to be at least 100. Uh, I think he stopped at 100 for me, but um, it was awesome. Place was going crazy. I gave, I put him in a headlock and it was, it was, he was just a great, great kid. And then we, uh, we, we brought him down, you know, here, we did like a press conference and he signed a contract with the Panthers cause he beat me in the, we, we just went crazy with it. Um, oh, and by the way, we also, um, I have to say this cause I got to brag about our foundation and our owner, but, um, but, uh, he beat, you know, I, I, I he beat me, but I did beat the other five. I want to make sure everyone knows that. But since they all had a part of my speech back to, you know, failure and, you know, responding to failure. And I, I told stories about so many times I failed in life and getting back up. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm I have pretty much a simple mantra, which is just like run your head against the wall and get through things. Um, and as part of that speech, you know, I kind of thought of this on the fly. I said, Hey, I know five out of six of you, you know, might've failed today because you didn't beat me in this push-up contest, but you all had the courage to come up here on this stage in front of all these people and do this. And I said, you're all getting a thousand bucks. So all five, all, all six of them got it, you know, from the wow. foundation and all. It was really cool. Yeah. And then but Vinny and our, and our group always empowered me to do these things and give back. And, you know, so it all comes from our identity of, of being military folks and service oriented. And he enables me to, to do these things and 
obviously he, he backstops, backstops a lot of stuff. And, uh, but that was a, one of our wonderful moments. Um, and, uh, I don't know how I got on that train, but I think, I think I'm seeing that a lot of people like the story. So no, great, great <laughs> feedback, man. And, and we're learning more about how some of those elements of the of the uh, military influence life now are influence your position here with the Panthers. Uh, talk a little bit about the transition from Wall Street to either mm. the transition from the military to Wall Street, or maybe even the transition from Wall Street to the Panthers, uh, mm. and maybe how yeah. some of those simple lessons that you spoke to with the military are applicable now yeah I, I think the military to wall street will be interesting um you know i had a, i had a three years in between uh to go to graduate school um so I, I did a business school and law school but even though i had that buffer when i when i showed up and i worked at goldman sachs as you know white shoe firm you know one of the well-known firms on wall street and you know when i first showed up my first day i, I really felt like a fish out of water you know, it was, uh, I had the baggy suit, my shirt was, you know, not fitted, you know, all these folks, um, you know, it just came from different, let's just call it different backgrounds. And I'm not saying that I, I don't want, I, I, my father and mom gave me everything that they could afford. I, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't want to make it like I didn't have opportunity because they enabled me to be able to do everything. But I think a lot of the folks uh, put it this way, the guy sitting next to me, his name was Chip, and he went to, you know, a private school his whole life, which is great. I might, hopefully Flora's going to go to private school, but it was, it was a boarding school, and, you know, and then he went to, you know, Harvard, which is awesome. I hope Flora goes to Harvard, but it just, for that moment in my life, you know, it was a little bit different, you know, upbringing, and, and um, you know, uh, I, I just, I didn't have, um, let's call it like the salesmanship, salesmanship, the polish, the um, kind of business acumen and like smoothness and style that is important in business, especially on Wall Street. And, and fortunately or unfortunately, sometimes people do business with each other, invest in people. And a lot of it has, um, uh, has to do with how you look and how you talk and how you frame things and maybe not necessarily the substance of things. Um, although the substance is what really matters. So, you know, that was a, a big transition to me. You know, I, I can tell like every person I met would like look me up and down and what kind of shoes this person have. It was a, it was a very, you know, I think most people call it superficial, but it also, I would also say that it is important on how you present and how you carry yourself. And um, so that was, that was a big transition for me. And I, and then I wasn't, you know, I didn't live around the markets all the time. I didn't like graduate from college and go like, you know, right as an analyst and, and was in investment banking and like, you know, had that like grunt work, um, you know, just real like blocking and tackling of the financial world. So when you don't have that foundation and you're kind of coming in, you know, 30 years old, a bit older, coming out of business school, you know, it is a big adjustment. You know, my blocking and tackling was literally blocking and tackling like overseas, which has been great for me and great for leadership. Um, but, you know, um, but it, it, it t that took a while. Um, the first two years at Goldman, everything's extremely objective, uh, very based on really how much revenue you bring into the firm through trading and investments. And um, I, I started with a class of 15 or so people, all top schools and everything. Um, I was the GOAT, not the GOAT that you're all thinking, my greatest of all time, but at West Point, we call the last ranked person the GOAT. Because oh, wow. that's that's the Navy's mascot, right? So we joke that the last ranked guy is is the Navy uh, goat. So um, and I see this question about the War Memorial. I'll touch. I'll get to that. You know, when I start telling funny stories. But um, I, uh, I I was the last ranked person on a revenue basis. So when they brought me in after my first two years, I I thought I was getting fired. You know, I was like, this is it. And the partner said to me, Matt way just worried you're going to stop doing everything you're doing now i said excuse me he's like you're doing all the right things like you're the hardest worker um you're learning faster than everyone else. like it's gonna pop for you like you you like i know it doesn't look and this is some of wall street standards usually it's like quarterly earnings where are we at um oh sorry chip lamarca oh my god i, I know i uh I, I made a joke about uh and i love chip lamarca by the way but um Let's just say he uh, wasn't as down to earth as you are. Okay, Chip, sorry about that. Um, he's referencing my, my joke before. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I was, I was uh, 
you know, uh, it was the last right person I thought Wall Street for sure they would say to me that, you know, you're either you're out or you know, you know, this is a warning. And they said, no, no, like you're just you're, we're investing you in the future and, um, you know, it, it, it's going to work for you. And over that next year or so, things really started to work out for me. And, um, you know, it all ended with um, not ended, but it all transitioned with a, a relationship that I developed with Vinny Viola that I work okay. for now. Um that came into the firm and started a big relationship with the firm. And, and um, I, I would, I think I did go to the actual goat, you know, to the top of that class, but anyway, uh, the sports goat. Um, and uh, anyway, so, th so things worked out. And after about four years there, mostly through per perseverance, then he said to me, all right, you're doing great at this firm. You do great for me. And I love being a client there. Uh, but it's time for you to come join my side of the table. So I joined Vinny's, you know, family office and started working for him and in his whole investment, you know, world. And then, and then he bought the team about a year or so afterwards and said, you know, I need someone on the ground that I can trust. I just got this, you know, um, you know, great investment. And, you know, he told me uh, just come down here for about two weeks and get the lay of the land. And I think that was almost six years ago now. So I've never left. So, and it's been Fantastic. awesome. And, yeah. But I, I want to make sure I hit, hit these questions. Um, pandemic, uh, War Memorial is still a go. It slowed us down a little bit uh, just on our end. Um, obviously, we've had no revenue in almost a year now. All concerts, all games completely stopped. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the city has been amazing. We've gone through all of our permitting and stuff. I think we're going to break ground here in, in, in a few months. My guess is by like, you know, you know March or April. So uh, it slowed us a little bit, but it is still a full go. Our owner is not flinched. Um, it's just, you know, our owner, I have to, I, I brag about him all the time. He is, he is not fired one person. He hasn't furloughed. He hasn't salary cut. Whatever term you've heard over the last year with every business, um, you know, Vinny said, no way. We're going to stick by our people. That They have enough stresses in their life. Um, and, you know, I, you know, he's, he's continued to fund the whole arena and the team and all and, He's an amazing guy, and you know, with the War Memorial, he's you know that's all going to be privately funded. And then I also see um, from John, um, uh, someone else just asked about the War Memorial. Oh, okay. Um, so what the Panthers are doing at the War Memorial are we are building a new practice facility uh, at the War Memorial. So if, you, if you're familiar with the building, uh, on the back side of the building, we're going to be putting in two sheets of ice. The Panthers are going to move their practice facility there, and then. We're going to do a bunch of community uh, youth hockey, public skating. Um, right. Yeah. And then the, the actual auditorium, this is a part that a lot of people don't realize just because we haven't done a huge marketing blitz on it yet. But the, the front part is if when you walk in, we're going to put in a small concert venue, about 3,500, 4,000 uh, ballroom seating, open, open floor. We're going to partner, you know, with Live Nation on that. That's our big partner at the, at the arena. Um, we're basically – we're basically taking our relationship that we have in the bb &T center and making a small version of that in one memorial. Um, you know, it's great to be, you know, right there in downtown Fort Lauderdale and we're going to yes. continue to have our facility that we have in Coral Springs. We have three sheets of ice there. So even though we're moving our practice facility, we're going to continue to own that and continue to invest and continue to have all of our youth hockey and stuff there. So, um, uh, and then Very just one other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, John just asked about, you know, Panthers are a great community partner. I appreciate that so much in terms of given the challenges in the NHL has faced, uh, what can we do as a community to support the Panthers aside from purchasing tickets? You know, it's, I, I, yeah, I appreciate asking that. And, you know, yeah, obviously we, we love fans. We love people being engaged with the, the, the brand and coming out and enjoying the games. I think also in addition to that, I think the more um, you can partner with us, not just with ticketing, but reach out to us and, let's see how we can help each other's businesses. There's always sponsorship opportunities. There's vendor opportunities with us. We, you know, we have a, a building that brings in, you know, a million or so people per year between the hockey games and all the concerts. So we have access to an incredible demand of, of consumers that come through. And there's, there's, there's not a business that we don't touch uh, that can do something with us. So business owners reach out and uh, we'd love to talk to you about our, to our, our sponsorship and partnership group. And there's so many ways that we can work together and, you know, talk about us, watch us on TV, you know, um, you know, um, you know, just, just be engaged with the brand. I think the more people are 
uh, following us on social media. You know, we're all, we're obviously on everything. If you're a Facebook user, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, we're, we're everywhere. Follow us, like us, just be with us. You know, even if you don't buy a ticket, you know, if you don't, you can't make the drive, come to the game, whatever, just, you know, you can still be associated with the brand. You know, we, we want to be in the DNA of Broward County. Um, so that's why we try to be everywhere. Um, okay. Um, Excellent. There's, there's more right, questions. That, Andrew, I don't know if you want to go with your. No worries. We'll jump back to some of those from the crowd. Let's, let's get into a couple okay. more leadership uh, uh, questions. Yeah. Let's talk, uh, decision making and, and hiring. Um, you're talking about day to day operations over with the Panthers. So the, I think it's mm -hmm. a good segue into this. So uh, obviously the NHL draft has a lot of moving pieces to it uh, in the mm -hmm. context of decision making. What goes into that for you and, and your team in terms of, you know, getting ready, uh, the ultimate decision? What's the, the process? Yeah. So you touched on, yeah, this is a great, you touched on so many different aspects of the business. And I think this is what is exciting about like the sports entertainment world. So starting with the NHL draft, I mean, that process alone deserves another zoom, you know, there's so much thought and analytics and scouting and um, you know, how you do in the draft is the number one predictor of your team. You know, there's very, very rare in all of sports, you know, as convoluted as complicated as sports are the one common thread the one principle that like you can't miss on is you've got to draft well. I mean, the way, especially, I mean, every team will probably say this, but for us, especially in hockey and hockey depth and teamwork and all of your players being bought in and working hard and are the same character is so important. And I'll give you a simple reason why, if you ever watch a hockey game, let's just say there's someone on here that knows nothing about hockey. And there might be a number of people, but um, if you watch the game, you, you, one thing you probably see is, is these guys jumping over the board all the time. All these lines are switching. And the reason for that is because the hockey players skate and go so hard that they're usually only on the ice for like 40, 50 seconds at a time, maybe a minute. A minute gets to be long. So you're exerting all your – it's like a sprint for like, let's just call it a minute, okay? And you're so exhausted that you got to pop back off. You know, imagine in basketball, the guys are just like, hey, dude, I got to step off to the side. You know, you're going back and forth. So hockey, that's how it works. Um, so you jump off, you jump off, you jump into the, you know, the stands. And um, uh, so, so given that, like your best player, your, your Michael Jordan, your LeBron James, okay, um, probably only plays about 30% of the game. Okay. Think about that, right? There's like 60 minutes. Wow. And they pay, they play like, yeah, 20, 22 minutes. So, so, you know, I mean, if anyone's not basketball fans, LeBron James plays like 90, at least 90% of the game, you know, whatever they can maybe give him a rest here and there. But so if that's the case, you've got to have a lot of good players, you know, so superstars and hockey, it's actually one of the problems why they have a marketing problem is, you know, you have superstars, but they're not playing all the time because they get so exhausted. That's really what it comes down to. So you have to have a lot of good players. The team is more important. Um, why, why am I saying all that? So the draft, if you miss on a pick and you don't get the right person and, and that doesn't have the right uh, intelligence makeup, that doesn't have the right character. So we, and we just brought in a new general manager because we felt that our process around the draft was not as in-depth and, and analytical and thorough as it should be. That's probably the number one reason, you know, we, you know, you, you've probably all watched the movie Moneyball, baseball, and, you know, there's, there's, there's all this data science and analytics that are coming into sports. That's great, but it can't dominate your thinking. And we've struggled with this. When we first started, we came from the army and finance and Wall Street. So we thought like data was everything. And we tried to instill that culture and we tried to push it too hard at first. And that was a mistake. We had to find a hockey leader that believes in data and considers that as part of his, his or her toolbox. But you can't forget the scouting. You can't forget the leadership. You can't forget, you know, the feel of, of people, the emotion and, and how they're going to play and the, 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 the perseverance. I mean, I, I, I didn't tell you about how Wild Bill taught me that wild bill well by the way that's my dad's name wild bill all right um so i told you you know he was a little crazy and wild but he wasn't teaching me data as a kid okay he was teaching me how to work hard right so that's what i led with um but why did i not lead with that when i got to the sports team right we we, we thought we got too smart and and you know we, we so we learned all that so then 
But then we got to a period where we weren't looking at enough data. Everything in life is a balance and, and you, you go from one extreme to the other. Look at our country right now. Um, and, you know, it, it's about like getting people's input, being diverse, considering everyone's thoughts and impressions and pushing everyone, but having people a part of the team. And once you find that balance, I think we have finally, it's taken us five, six years. We have a GM now that takes all those tools to, for the draft. So I'm sorry I went really deep there and long, but that's more no, of like the hockey stuff. Um, yeah. You you, say something you're actually there? leading me down to my, to my next question okay. and talking about bringing on the new GM and whether it's a new GM or uh, additional staff or management team that you're looking, what are some of those additional qualities that you're looking for? You talked about how data played uh, an influence and obviously somebody that's open to data, but it not being strictly about data. What are some of those other qualities that you're looking for? Yeah. I mean, I think the first one is um, it, it'd be perfect if you had no ego. I think all of us have some ego um, for all of our ambition and stuff, but as little ego as possible. Ego is probably, I would say, I wouldn't even say probably, is like the number one problem uh, in business, right? So for example, someone in a meeting speaks up about an idea. I think we should draft this player, okay? And people get into an argument. That person gets defensive because they believe in that. That person's mad because of their experiences or wherever they got to that answer. We make that draft pick. A year later, we realize it's wrong and it wasn't the right person. But then that person defends it all because they're worried about their ego about being wrong. Instead, we could have said, okay, that's wrong. Let's learn from that. Let's not do that next time. And I'm just, I'm just making all this on the fly. I'm not thinking of a specific example. You, you could probably take that example and apply it to any way, you're, whether you're in government, whether you're in, you know, casino, entertainment, you know, um, any of the businesses that are, on, you know, in here, where, Absolutely. you know, whereas if you come out with something, that's your opinion, get it challenged, say, okay, wow, you know what, what you said makes a lot of sense. I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking of that. And just, so I tried to be overly, um, open about when I'm wrong in meetings and, and, and encourage people to challenge and get to the right, right, right answer. You know, and that, so like, you have to find people that are like humble and team oriented and, and don't, they can't be about them and it can't be about, you know, what they've all done. You know, once people start saying, I did this, I did that, this because of me, I'm like, all right, next, you know, it's mm -hmm. very rarely have we all just done something on our own. We either got advice from someone or we seek someone's opinion or, someone helped. So I think that's a big part. Yeah. I think you know, we can, you hear this all the time. We can teach you everything that we need. Right. But it's hard to teach the things that your family taught you or what you were trained in college or like just the life skills that you have. It's really hard to teach those. Um, I would say like, you know, we always look for like an intellectual curiosity, right? So you didn't have to go to Harvard. You didn't have to go to West Point. Um, you can go wherever you want. And maybe you didn't have the opportunity to go to those schools. Maybe that, you know, you didn't have the money to go to those schools. So, but if someone's curious, like they want to learn that I take that person over a Harvard person any day of the work week, because they're going to learn and get around. And if they're hungry, they're going to spend the extra time and they're going to get in early and leave late just to, you know, to, to, you know, cause they're, they're excited. They're passionate. You know, you, you need that curiosity in people if you have curiosity and ambition, you can learn anything, you know? So those, those are traits that, um, that we, uh, that we look for in, in our hiring. I mean, I talked a little bit more about the NHL specific stuff, but we do so much hiring in sales and marketing and operations. We hire a ton of veterans, you, you, you know, uh, the owner's a veteran, the CEO's a veteran, the COO's a veteran. Um, we probably are too biased towards veterans. Uh, I, I love them, but no, we, all of our part-time staff, we look to vets. Um, and then we, we, we try to be diverse. You know, we, we bring in people from finance, legal background, sports background, low income, anything we can find to bring in, you know, just new ideas to our, our company. And if people believe in a mission and a vision and, they, you know, we, we, our, our vision, listen, everybody's trying to win the Stanley Cup. Every team, right? There's only one team that does it every year. So there's like 30 teams that are, don't accomplish their mission every year, right? So, so we, we keep an aspirational mission of, being good stewards of the community, being family oriented and, and, and being like this great place to work. Like that, that's something we, oh, that, that can, you can always do that and always strive for that. And then of course, we're always trying to win the cup, but um, you know, we want to almost be bigger than that. 
So absolutely, Matt. Yeah. You alluded to it a little bit earlier. I think it would be great for the group because uh, you touched on it. It's not something that's all uh, often touched on in conversations like this. It's always focused on biggest accomplishments. But let's talk about biggest failures and 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 how you bounce yeah. back. Yeah. <sighs> I, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. There's so many. I want to make sure I get, like, the right one. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So I think that um, this one's, this one's um, a little intense, okay, uh, but it shows um, about, um, you know, you know, being in battle and being pushed and making decisions. And, um, and I, I think it's something that's, that's really important, you know, for us to share. So, you know, when I came out of West Point, um, you know, I had all this education, I had, um, you know, all the things I've just talked about and stuff. But by the time I was 24 years old, I was in the middle of Iraq. It was part of Operation, you know, Iraqi Freedom uh, 2, which was the kind of the second phase of the war, you know, this was well after, our president was saying, well, right after our president was saying that all, well, you know, combat operations were over and all of us were in Iraq, we're like, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but, and I'm not trying to be political, just I mean, being real. Um, but I um, was there and we had a, a situation where <clears throat> um, we had, you know, kind of captured these guys had, that put in this roadside bomb. Okay. And I, um, um, while they were doing that, there was a, a little girl that was killed in the middle of all this. And I won't get into all the details. So, so we had this decision to make around, like, we wanted to try to save the girl. And I was trying to get her back to, you know, our camp and, and, and save her. Um, uh, but we obviously had the mission of, like, capturing these guys, okay? And all my experienced people, my sergeants, uh, then Sergeant Blackman, Sergeant Goins, um, these are wonderful guys um, that have been around the block that, been there before they were like sir you know the base is only about a mile away let's just split up our platoon take two trucks and like you know head back you know to the camp let's try to save her and then keep two trucks keep these guys captured we'll call in support but <clears throat> i got a little too academic you know and this is stuff that you learn in school uh but you don't learn in life which was oh there's an order out there that when we're driving around you have to be with four trucks as you drive through the, the province and everything. And I can't break away from that. You know, and they were afraid of, if we only had two trucks, you'd get attacked. And, um, and I, I just was stubborn and I was uh, academic and I was, um, I, some people would say I was following orders, but I was following somewhat of a bureaucratic order. This wasn't like a, a general said to me, like, do this now. This was like a policy that um, if you, you know, if you're being flexible and you're listening to people and you're understanding the situation. And um, so we, we left the guys who put in the bomb with some like local police. We took the four trucks, which is policy wise to try to get the girl back. We got the girl back. By the time we got her back, she unfortunately passed away. We tried to race back out there and um, the guys paid off the police and got away. Right? Wow. Yeah. So I, um, I, you know, this is a, this is an intense story and I'm, I'm just sharing this because I figured, you know what, it is a big failure in my life and I think about it and I, I, I want to share this with all of you because there's so many times that things go wrong, but that could have just like rocked me, you know, and I still get emotional talking about it now, you know, but you have to, you know, I don't know what exactly the takeaway there is, um, but I think, you know, because it, cause it kind of could have went both ways, right? Wait a minute, Matt, you were following policy, you were doing this, but it goes to show you sometimes your failures in life, you know, aren't clearly defined and you just have to like stay straight. And, but I think I could have listened to people, especially experienced folks that have done this before. And maybe they didn't have the rank or they didn't have the schooling that I had um, that, you know, that, that stayed with me the rest of my life. And, you know, I'm always seeking input. I'm never the one who said, Hey, I worked at Goldman and this is what we did. This mm -hmm. is, you know, I worked for Vinny and this is what Vinny did. So we're going to do this. I have those, principles in me i know what a lot of great things have done but i always say well wait a minute maybe that doesn't apply here right you know i'm sure if i sat down with a west point professor you say oh matt you were in a heat of battle you shouldn't follow policy well you know so um so i that taught me uh about listening and it taught me about experience and it taught me about you know you don't always know the right answer 
So I, I, I think that was an intense story. I'm sorry. No, that. thank you I for sharing. Definitely yeah, a, yeah. a lot that can be learned from that. Uh, yeah. And a, some, some insight to, you know, a, a perspective that many of us would never have had. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. L- l- let's move in, a, in, a, in another direction and talk about, <laughs> you know, initiatives that, that you champion that you're most proud of mm. over your career. Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah. So um, I, 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 it definitely would be with the Panthers. Um, and, um, you know, this one, um, and there's a couple, and I want to make sure I nail the right one. Uh, yeah, this one, um, well, first off, just real quickly, Vinny keeping all the staff um, employed this year was one of my most proud, you know, moments. But that was Vinny's decision. Absolutely. He's paying. Okay, so I want to make sure you all know that. But me that I had an, like an actual influence on was, um, uh, yeah, Hurricane Irma. If you guys remember that a few years ago, yeah. um, thankfully it didn't, well, it hit some other areas very badly, but at least for us in Broward County, it didn't hit what it could have been. It could have been like a Cat 5 and as of like the Saturday night before, we were looking down the barrel of like a brutal, brutal, um, you know, natural disaster, really. And what I was most proud of is when I called our owner, I said, listen, we're, you know, this is a real tough spot. And, you know, as always, without a flinch, he said, um, he said, you know, Matt, you know, you tell Broward County that, you know, we're there for them. We're, we're a civic center more than anything else. And we opened up the doors of the bb and Center and had uh, Florida Power and Light, about 2,000 workers from them. We had all emergency management, Sunrise Police, Broward Sheriff's Office, all those folks with us. And then as soon as the hurricane break, you know, we were out there helping people deliver water and supplies. Uh, we then, then, you know, we had Jet, we partnered with Jet Blue. They put in food trucks all over the parking lots. Um, we went down to the Florida Keys with Ford and delivered, you know, they were, the Keys were devastated. All those, Isle Murata, you probably remember all that. Yes, and sir. I was like, wow, you know, you know, um, here we are trying to win hockey games, which clearly and we're trying to make money. Any business is trying to do that. But we took two weeks and said, you know what, we're just going to roll up the sleeves and and uh, be there and, and, and run out. And that was my most proud initiative because I really felt like it reminded me of the military. And, you know, it's the service, you know, mentality that we're trying to instill in the franchise. So that was two that very was awesome. uh, huge accomplishments. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but the, the Panthers were – uh, one of uh, our, there were only an, uh, a small number of teams within the uh, NHL that were able to retain all of their staff. Yeah, it's down to two teams. Yeah, it's Three us teams. and uh, okay, wow. uh, two, two. Yeah, two. Us and the, the Nashville, Nashville Predators. I'm going to give them a shout out. They got a great CEO and ownership and stuff. Yeah, it's only two teams left. So uh, but take that, New York and Boston and all the <laughs> other teams up there. So absolutely. All right. Well, um, I'm going to send this back over to Bob. Uh, very much appreciate your time and the dialogue today. Uh, definitely have got uh, a page full of notes here myself. I hope that the everyone out joining us today was able to enjoy the conversation and take something away from it. I wish you the best uh, and the Panthers good luck this season, especially with uh, your first game. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Bob. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Talk about a, a genuine and inspiring conversation. Uh, you guys rock. Uh, Thank you know, you. Uh, you think about the old school values that Matt talked about and, you know, being your foundation. Uh, I was trying to think of a name for your mom. If your dad was Wild Bill, your mom sounds like <laughs> a rock. <laughs> yeah. Well, she kept it all good. She's like Mother Goose. Yeah, just like kept the train moving. Well, you think about that sense of service and unlimited potential um, as, as a foundation to work from. And, and Matt, your comment about curiosity, I could not agree mm-hmm. more. When people yeah. talk to me about the team at the Alliance, and uh, and I think I'm pretty fortunate like you are. I come to work every day with an amazing group of people at the Alliance, but the quality I always look for is curiosity. If, if you want to understand how something works, and to your point, if you have a little bit of ambition, you mix with that, you know, your folks can, they're, they're, those are self-starters and they want to learn, and it's a great way to build a team. So uh, again, thank you both. It was uh, an awesome, awesome conversation. Um, and it's a unique way. Uh, we really hope these leadership series would do what you guys accomplished this morning and, and give folks uh, a, a better connection to you. I could, I could listen for another hour. 
Uh, so, <laughs> I know you guys have busy things to do. We've got folks on, on the call, so we do want to wrap up. But uh, again, I want to thank our sponsors uh, that are on your screen or should be on your screen. Um, and I want to make sure that uh, everyone sees the uh, in the January 22nd issue of the Business Journal, the story on the highlights of today's session. Um, today's session will be posted online along with the other uh, speaker series events at gflalliance.org. Um, slash speaker series. Um, please be sure to join us for the next leadership speaker event on February 5th, which will feature Mike Jackson, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of AutoNation, in an interview moderated by Rita Case, President and CEO of Rick Case Automotive Group. Um, two automotive rock stars um, that I've gotten to know over the years, and I, I hope that you all get a uh, the same kind of, uh, of uh, opportunity that we received this morning with, with Matt and Andrew. Um, I know that, uh, that, that Mike and Rita will, will be the same ilk, uh, but uh, really appreciate the genuine conversation. Thank you guys again. And thanks to all our viewers that tuned in today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next month on February 5th. Y'all have a good, uh, good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.